Hi, I'm Simon. I run a company called Advancing Analytics in the UK. You might know me from the Advancing Spark YouTube channel, where I spend a lot of my time talking about Databricks and Delta, data engineering with Spark, and various other things. You may also have seen me this morning talking about SQL analytics and about how to get started with Databricks Autoloader to solve a load of really difficult data engineering problems. So I am super excited to welcome you to the Thursday afternoon keynotes. And up first, I am so excited because we've got Dr. Machega Cooper and Adam Stelzner from the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. Now, Dr. Mu, as she likes to be known, is their lead planetary protection engineer, which is like the coolest job title. And she works to make sure that we don't take any earthly contaminants when we're visiting foreign bodies such as Mars. And Adam serves as the chief engineer on the Mars 2020 and the Mars rover projects. So between them, there's a huge wealth of experience and knowledge and some pretty cool stuff. They both work tirelessly to inspire people to get into STEM, to achieve the impossible. And I am so excited to listen to their first keynote up now. We are starting the straighten up and fly right maneuver in preparation for parachute deploy. The navigation yes. has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration. Sky team maneuver has started. About 20 meters off the surface. We're getting signals from the MRO. Touchdown confirmed. Yeah. Perseverance yeah. safely yeah. on the surface of Mars. Ready to begin seeking the sands of half life. Looks like we're getting the first image. This is the most amazing thing. This is what NASA does. This is what we can do as a country. We landed a rover on Mars in a global pandemic. In fact, we launched her from Kennedy Space Center at the height of the summer surge. And Moo was boots on the ground working that end of the project. When we were building the spacecraft, we deployed people out to Cape Canaveral in two waves. And I was among the people in the first wave on the 3rd of January, 2020. And little did I know that that would be the last time that I could step foot on an airplane for the next 16 months. Uh, it, it was an incredible journey to put this entire spacecraft together, to be able to unpack it, uh, to, to be able to file into a clean room, knowing that this global pandemic was occurring, knowing that you had to keep your distance from others, even though there are times as you're working with a spacecraft that you have to be relatively close. Uh, and you had to make sure that this operation came together and we got to the finish line. It was a very difficult. It was risky, but there are reasons why it's worth the risk. So why do we do this? Why did Moo and I spend a decade of our lives working on a rover to root around in the dirt of another planet? You know, we've been thinking about Mars for a while. It's captivated our attention. We've been going there, trying to unlock the mysteries of its history. We've put rovers, we've invented crazy ways of landing. We've looked and worked hard to explore Mars and the rest of the solar system. But why? Why do we do that? Well, when I think about exploration, when I think about human activity, such as exploration, I realize that almost all of the greatest things us humans do aren't particularly practical. In fact, art, theater, dance, music, the things that make us human are expressions of our internal humanity. I think ex exploration is like that. For me, when we explore, we're asking questions about ourselves. What, we, what are we capable of? We're, we're doing a piece of performance art in the art of the possible. This has been a lifetime in the making. I've wanted to do this since I was a kid. 
And Carl Sagan uh, in his series, The Cosmos, really inspired me to be an astrophysicist. And while I'm not an astrophysicist, the search for understanding our place in the universe, to understand whether or not we're alone, how does life propagate in our universe across planets, or across our solar system and outside of our own galaxy, are all questions that we're all trying to understand and explore and try to answer ultimately. Are we alone? We're driven by our native human curiosity. You know, I was a terrible student. I was playing rock and roll in the San Francisco Bay Area. And one night, returning home from playing a show, I noticed that the stars were in a different place in the night sky than they had been when I went out to play it. In fact, it was that constellation of Orion shown here over the Golden Gate Bridge. I thought that the stars were moving because I'd missed that whole earth spinning on its axis thing they teach you in school. But I got curious. And my curiosity eventually led me to landing spacecraft on the surface of Mars. We never really know how powerful our curiosity is unless we unchain it and let it take us wherever it might. Neil Armstrong mentioned it when he first stepped foot on the moon. You know, one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. When we explore, when we let our curiosity go, it takes us to new places. It changes us as a species. That's why we go to Mars. That's why Mu and I spent a decade of our lives building a crazy robot to root around on the dirt of another planet. All right, thank you, Mu and Adam. Mu, can you tell us a little bit about the rover? What does it look like? What's its spec? What is this thing? And I'd like to hear the same thing about the helicopter too. Yeah, so for the rover, especially if you go on mars.nasa.gov, you can actually play with a 3D rendering of the rover itself. But it's essentially a lab on wheels. Uh, it carries instruments that, for example, looks at the weather in the atmosphere, META. Uh, it looks, it is a ground, pen, ground penetrating radar in the back. Hmm. Uh, but there are all kinds of amazing, a suite of instruments that'll allow us to really understand a lot about the surface of Mars. Um, there are cameras all over the place. Uh, the, on the mast, there's a mast cam. There are landing cameras. There are cameras that look at your sample that you've acquired. Um, so yeah, it's essentially a very large uh, lab on wheels with a radiation source on the back, our MMRTG, uh, that allows it to stay powered and, uh, and finish its mission without worrying about the dust settling on solar panels um, and allow it to complete its scientific objectives. And although it's the size of a small SUV, like a it compact is. SUV, uh, it is huge compared to the tiny little helicopter ingenuity that we took to the surface. She is, her blades are about this long, this wide, and she is uh, a little under four pounds in weight and struggles at even at that, at those dimensions to get airborne in the vaporously thin atmosphere of Mars, which is only one one hundredth the density of here on Earth. Is it the first time we're putting a helicopter anywhere on space outside? This is the first time aerial flight has occurred off planet Earth. So it's our, you know, space Wright Brothers moment. And along those lines, they actually took a piece of the Wright Brothers airplane hmm. and made sure that it was clean enough. So planetary protection, it was actually autoclaved. So it was sterilized uh, before they mounted it onto the helicopter uh, fuselage. That's super cool. Adam, can you tell us a little bit about the role of data in this mission? Well, I mean, data is everything, right? Uh, we learn about Mars through the data that comes back from our spacecraft. In fact, when we look at Mars at increasing levels of resolution, we always are surprised. We always learn something new. That also goes here at Earth. I don't know if you guys remember the first scanning electron microscope images of like flies' eyes, and people were like, what? <laughs> you know, we always learn new things when we look more detailed and more deeply at the data that's sitting in the universe waiting for us. Now, in this, this is a gigapan of the surface of, of Jezero Crater. This is where we landed. And 
It, this image was a, is a composite of hundreds of images taken over the first week of our presence on the surface of Mars. And this is amazing. There is so much data in these images that we have to choose wisely how to bring it back and what data to bring it back. And in the future, we are augmenting the AI and autonomy that we have on board so that the spacecraft itself can do a better job of de determining what to take more detailed data on and what not. If it sees something that it thinks us humans back here on Earth would be interested in, it can take more high resolution imagery or even some remote sensing data. So we get to back to the end of the drive and the rover's done the drive we asked it to do, but there's a little postcard from the rover that said, hey, you know, in the middle of the drive, I saw something sort of cool. It looked like this. You want to go back and check it out? That's the kind of autonomy that we will need because the data at Mars is so rich and it's more rich than we can even get back to Earth. That's amazing. So really, I mean, it's a data collection mission in some sense. It's a data problem you're solving. You're getting there, collecting a bunch of data, and there's so much of it there. So you can't actually, so you have to be selective about what you pick. So I would love to know, what are some examples of large data products that you work with and, you know, that you have to use to, you know, be really effective around, you know, data sharing and those kind of things? Yeah, at least in my case, in planetary protection, we have to sample the spacecraft and assess how many microbes are on the surface. And not only do we culture it in the lab, but we also send it to get sequenced. Uh, and this DNA sequencing, you have terabytes worth of information, information that in order to interrogate, you need supercomputers to be able to, to dig in and determine what kind of microbes are they? What, what qualities and traits do they have? Are they extra resistant to certain environments? And these are examples of some of the data products and some of the, the needs that we have to be able to even skim the surface as far as what we're looking at. We've got this tiny little straw between Mars and Earth. It's our communication pathway. And so it's hard to move huge data volumes. We have to be very choosy about what data we move from Mars to Earth because of the communications choke points. So we do autonomous work on the surface of Mars with the spacecraft to understand what to, to send, what to look at, and what to interrogate because the data sets we can take, the data we can take on Mars is much bigger than the data we can get back to Earth. How much data can you send back and forth, uh, you know, over that uh, pipe? And how long does it take to send it? Is that? It varies very largely. We have two links. We have a direct to Earth link in the X band, and we have a link to orbiters in UHF. Some orbital passes, right? So there's a few orbiters in orbit around Mars. Sometimes an orbital pass will give us a gigabyte of data that we can get down. Sometimes it'll be hundreds of kilobytes because of where the orbiters are. And when we're talking direct to Earth, that's like dial up 9.6. I mean, we're talking, you know, kilobyte. I mean, it's very, 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 very tiny. We mostly use the direct Earth link to command. Our commands are tiny little uh, sequences. That's what we use the direct to Earth link. But for bringing big data back, we look for, we hope to have a good season or good weather in terms of our orbiters and where they are and how easily they can get to us. And these rovers, are they autonomous or you're actually driving them? We are not joysticking them. We give them complicated uh, requests, drive 500 meters to this waypoint. And then they've got onboard uh, software that uh, looks at the hazards, route plans, and gets the vehicle to the location to do the things we're asking. And in the case of anomalies, there is actually a duplicate rover here on Earth where you can test the software, test something, especially if there's something interesting that you are not certain may or may not work, you can test that out here on the ground before you send that up. And I'm curious about the helicopter. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how that went and uh, sort of, is there any inside scoop you have on that that you can share well, with us? The, Ali, in fact, the helicopter almost didn't make it to Mars. Hmm. You know, we were originally going to take the helicopter on the side of the rover. It was right between two of our wheels. That location required that the, that the rotors the uh, helicopter blades folded over so it could get into this small spot. 
the helicopter team was being, we were bringing them on board and they swore, oh, we got it coach, I can make it, we can make it. But we looked at it and we said, Man, they're not gonna make it. If they have to do all of this folding of their helicopter, it's already hard enough to make a helicopter fly on Mars. The, the laws of helicopter design are turned head on its head to make a helicopter fly at Mars compared to here on Earth. And so we made a call, slightly risky call, to move them from the side of the rover and onto the belly of the rover. This allowed the, the helicopter to stay spread out, its blades to stay straight, and ultimately allowed it to make it to the surface of Mars safely. That's awesome. Uh, I'm curious, everybody's talking about life on Mars. Was there life? Is there life? Will there be life? This is sort of what everybody's obsessed about. But is that the only reason uh, we go up there or are there other things, uh, the other questions we can ask that are important? There are so many questions to be asked and, and so many questions that the rover is primed to, to ask. Uh, one of which is, can we send humans to Mars? And if you look at the calibration target for Sherlock, you notice that there are a few materials on there that are composed of, of uh, spacesuit materials. Um, and, and these spacesuit materials, you want to understand, do they survive over time? Do they degrade? And that's yet another question that we're going to answer uh, in the near future is, do we have the right materials? That's amazing. And I'm curious, from a perspective of space exploration, why do you feel it's important to share the research findings from past and current missions? And how is it being done? How can we improve that? Well, we believe uh, we operate for the people of the United States and we take the data that we get every day and we pump it out to the people of the United States and frankly, to the people of the world. It's a open source in some sense. And, um, and we believe in that, right? That's collaboration. That's how you get the most out of humanity is by giving the information out for people all over the place to operate on and make the breakthroughs and realizations that can take our understanding forward. So, you know, there's no humans on this, right, on Perseverance. How mission critical is it? I mean, you know, if it fails, we can try again next year. Well, depends on how you want to look at it, right? It's $2.7 billion of the federal budget. That's wow. much wow. more money than I'll ever see in my life. <laughs> um, but perhaps far more importantly, it's the better part of a decade of thousands of humans, pretty smart humans, working really hard, nights and weekends, the whole thing, putting this rover together, planning to operate her. When it comes down to the landing event, landing night, boy, you don't want to let all of your colleagues down. It's that, that's the biggest and the most important thing for me is, is the human capital that we have invested in this machine. And then final question uh, to each of you. Uh, when are we going to see humans on Mars? I hope to see humans on Mars within the next uh, two or three decades. I, I talk to kids all the time in elementary school, and I honestly believe that one of the kids that I, that I speak to will eventually set foot on the surface of Mars. Uh, so I, I think it'll be maybe 20, 30 years down the, down the line. There's just so much more to understand. Our bodies are sensitive. All right, Moon. What do you think, Adam? Um, I agree with Moo. You know, uh, we are of this world, of Earth, and, uh, you know, everything, the microbiome that is us. You talk to me as Adam, and I talk to Moo as Moo, but it's 70 million creatures working in, in consorts together. And uh, so it's hard for us in space. Uh, we're not meant to be in space. We, we do lots of things we're not meant to do, and we can, and we will, but it will be a while because it's a long way to Mars. It's not like the moon. And um, I think, you know, 20 years, in terms of technology for space exploration, we've got enough in our hands right now to make a run at it. But it's really about what it means to our bodies to be in space that long over that course of a, of a, of a, of a journey. So 20, 30 years. That's the awesome. kids up today. That's amazing. Moo and Adam, thank you so much for sharing your story and inspiring us with your innovation. Thank you.